Hey, what's up, y'all? This is Lewis, Lewis Speaks 2024, and today I'm going to talk to you all about sexual Stockholm Syndrome. You know, Stockholm Syndrome is basically a condition where someone over identifies with their oppressors. They begin to take on the characteristics of those who have oppressed them in an effort to survive. And when you relate that to sexuality, especially gay male sexuality, a lot of us are adopting these toxic, unhelpful behaviors in an effort to survive the life. Um, I know that I have had so many monsters in my bed. I have had a lot of monsters in my bed when I was in the life and it hurt. You know, I will be dealing with men who did not care how they left me emotionally, men who left my mind and my heart in a state of turmoil, men who did not care about my pleasure. They would just be so consumed and so obsessed with their own pleasure that they didn't care about pleasing me. They would bust their nut, put on their clothes and bounce. And there I was wondering what happened. You know, what happened to the person that I met who seemed to be invested? And after dealing with enough of these monsters, I started to get angry. My hurt transformed into anger and a desire to get even. You know, I had a vendetta. For the longest time, I had a vendetta. I was so angry at these men who just didn't care. And so I adopted their characteristics. I became the monster. I didn't care about partners. I just cared about my own pleasure. And this left me feeling spent. It left me feeling hollow. It left me feeling broken. And I thought it would make me feel more powerful. And initially it did. But then after a while, I realized that this is not good. This is not healthy. I would begin crying. I would be very depressed. My spirit was broken. And I realized that that's not who I am. I was only doing that in an effort to survive, you know? And this is what I see a lot of gay men doing in an effort to survive the life and to survive the culture, this culture of negligence, this culture of indifference. In an effort to survive the culture, they are becoming monsters. I became a monster. And the thing about it is I had a very spiritual foundation. You know, I knew the word. I, I had a, a rich spiritual heritage to draw from. And yet I became a monster because of this life. The life turns you into a monster. You think you know who you are? Guess again. You don't know who you are until you enter into the gay life. You deal with men who don't care anything about you. <sighs> these men are just broken. They're broken. And a lot of these men, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, it's story time right now. Um, I hooked up with a dude, you know, this was a long time ago. I hooked up with this dude. And after I hooked up with him, I was curious as to what was on his Facebook. So I searched for him on Facebook and then I saw one of his posts who said, and it read, I'm gonna do to these men what my father did to my mother. Whoa. This was the same dude who also refused to pleasure me. So, okay. <laughs> What's going on here? Is this the mindsets that I'm dealing with? Are these the broken men that I'm dealing with? Men who refuse to invest in your pleasure? Men who refuse to actually care about you and show that care and concern in a real way? Men who live to hurt, disease, abuse, infect, damage you, and then feel this sense of power because of how they affected and infected you. There are so many men out there who are HIV positive, gay men out there who are HIV positive, going around here infecting other men. And they don't care. They don't care about using condoms. They're angry, they're vengeful, they have a vendetta. And I realized that this, 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 
this cycle continues. This cycle keeps on continuing. And so what ends up happening is that we have a low trust economy. There is no trust. You have men now taking PrEP, PEP, DoxyPEP, all these medications, which we don't really know the long-term side effects of, by the way, and we don't know how they'll make us, I guess, resistant to other antibiotics in the future, but I digress. It's what we have to do now in order to get dogged. It's like, it's just funny to me how we are preparing ourselves for war, right? We know this is war. We know this is not healthy, but yet still we're protecting ourselves and preparing ourselves for this war. We're preparing ourselves to be corrupted, to be damaged, to be destroyed, right? I see the men who are bottoms. They're sitting here fleeting, which is basically shoving a douche up their rectum and basically flooding their rectum out with water. I'm gonna be very graphic, by the way, because I want to drive home a point. So basically they're shoving this douche up their rectum, cleaning themselves out to be destroyed. That's like you preparing your skin for it to be knifed, preparing your body to be murdered. That's what we're doing. We're preparing our bodies to be murdered. Preparing our spirits to be murdered. You know, we're dealing with these men who don't want to take us out on dates. They don't want to love on us. They don't want to dignify us with a date, with quality time. They just want to annihilate us, destroy us. They romanticize our destruction. This is why I had to fall back. I had to fall back and take a step back because something is just not right here. It's just not right. My spirit feels it. And when your spirit is starting to pick up on that, it's starting to detect something ain't right. Men who say that they're undetectable. Okay, how do you know? At what point do you know when the virus can be detected in your blood? Are you a scientist? Right? Men who say things like, what, untransmittable, you equals you. Right? But at what point do you become detectable? Do you know? No, you don't. You're not a scientist. You don't have a test tube. You don't have a microscope that can analyze your cell structure, right? But they want to tell you things like, oh, I'm negative on PrEP, when really they're positive on meds. There's no honesty here. They say love is a battlefield. This is more than just a battlefield. This is a cycle of insanity. And this is once again not a video to demonize or justify the abuse, torment, or denial of rights to gay men. This is not that video. So if you think that it is, it's not. You should not be hurting gay men. I'm here to tell you that right now. What I'm doing this video for, my purpose, is because I want to wake these men up. I want to wake us all up. And when I say these men, when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to myself too, because a lot of we're deceived. We've been deceived. We've been deceived. We're out here becoming murderers, orchestrating the murder of other men, and we don't even know it. We're killing and murdering their trust. And when you don't trust people, that basically plays out in every relationship that you get into. You know? A lot of men are being denied good quality friendship because they don't trust men. And rightfully so. There's a lot of dudes who are untrustworthy. You can't trust the man who rushes you in the bedroom. He rushes you to the bedroom, but he doesn't rush you to the place of worship. Does he pray over you? Does he pray over your life? I've never had a gay man pray over me, never. They never prayed over their food, let alone me. Two things that they consume, but they don't pray for. Because when I think about it, you know, I had a praying grandmother and that's what I think really helps also. She prayed over my life. When she was alive, she prayed over my life. I have a praying mom. She prays over my life. And you know something? 
These are people that love, when someone loves you, they pray over you. These men don't love me. They don't pray over me. They don't pray for my protection. If anything, they want to take off protection. They don't want to wear protection. They want to give me affection and infect me. That's what these men want to do. Everything with them, and I realize this, is about power and the procurement of power and control. They can't control various other aspects of their lives, so they try to use my body as a way to gain control, to gain that sense of power. Oftentimes, these men are using you as a power source. Do you know that? And if you were like me, when I was younger, I was so hungry for approval, for acceptance, for validation, that I would allow that. I would allow that just because I was so hungry for that validation. You know, for a hungry soul, a hard penis is a form of validation. For a hungry soul, a cum shot is a form of validation. When you are so hungry for your father's love, for that male approval, for that camaraderie, that companionship, you'll settle for these cheap substitutes. You'll settle for a couple of cum shots. Ah, I must be good. I must be a good lover because I made them bust. No, you're not a good lover. They wanted to bust because half the time they're just imagining what they see on porno films. You're just an extension of a pornography flick. You're just part of their pornographic imagination, honey. That's it. A lot of times we're just human socks that they dump their scum in. We're just socks. They're thinking of, you know, Raheem, you know, one of this, you know, one of these porn stars. Raheem, they're thinking of basically, you know, something, whatever porn stars are out here nowadays. They're thinking about these individuals. They're not thinking about you. But we think, oh, because they came for me then I must be something in the bedroom. It has nothing to do with you. And that's what I've learned. It has nothing to do with me. I know now that I am very valued and very wonderful. And it's just these men are so broken. And if you look to a broken man with a broken lens for your validation, you will never, never, never be full. Because for one, they're seeing through the eyes of brokenness. So they can never fill you up completely. And so I'm just like, you know, oftentimes in an effort to survive, we become like these men that are broken. And that's what sexual Stockholm syndrome is. That's the premise. You become like the people that have oppressed you. You start to adopt their characteristics and their traits in an effort to survive, you know? in an effort to continue to stay motivated to even try, you know? Many of us are blessed and also cursed with a hopeful imagination. And what do I mean when I say that? I mean that we're always hoping, we're always taking someone's potential and we are magnifying it. And we're hoping that something comes to fruition and we're not seeing reality. Gay men struggle with reality. We are designed to perpetuate fantasy. That's what we are. Many gay men, they rather live as someone's fantasy than be their reality. And I think because we struggle with seeing this reality and because we're so preoccupied with trying to be someone's fantasy, we end up hurting ourselves. We end up doing ourselves a grave disservice. We don't really see who these men we're dealing with are. We're too busy trying to live the reality or live the fantasy, mind you. We're too busy out here trying to live the fantasy. It's time to step into reality and see that this is not working. We're being deceived. We are one day, I know it, one day gay men are gonna wake up and realize, wow, I have been deceived. 
I've been deceived into thinking I can find love here. And does that mean that no gay man ever loves another gay? No, not at all. But I think that, you know, in terms of this romantic love, it's a struggle with two men. It's a struggle. I think there's such a thing as friendship love and you can really love a friend deeply, but I just don't think we really have the tools in order to be platonic friends with another person. And this is not the be all to end all. Some gay men have friends. Me personally, I was never able to secure a gay friend. It would last temporarily, but there would always be this sexual undercurrent where they either wanted to sleep with me or do something sexual. And when I didn't want to do that, they moved on. I think that that's a barrier in terms of men finding friends these days because a lot of gay men are looking for partners and heterosexual men, they're looking for friendships. You know, so there seems to be this clash, you know? A lot of heterosexual gay men, they're not with that. They're like, okay, look, if that's what you want to do, fine, but I'm looking for platonic. Do you know something? A lot of men in general struggle with platonic friendship. There always has to be an element of seduction, of power, domination. Vulnerability is necessary for friendships, right? Men struggle with vulnerability. They struggle with that honesty. They struggle with that just unabashed, this is me, this is who I am. Take it or leave it. They struggle with that. They're so busy trying to manage an image, maintain an image, maintain this image of, I guess, togetherness, like they have it all together and they're, they're not lost and they're fine. You know, it's just, we're human. Sure, the world wants us to be gods. I get it. Our women, our children, our other men, friends, they want us to be gods. They want us to be the God that they don't believe in, right? They want us to be God that lives in heaven. We are created in his image, so they want us to be that, but we're not that. We are just men, flesh, blood, coursing through our veins. That's all we are. And so people also need to realize this and temper their expectations when it comes to men, because I think that when they see men, they want to burden us with everything as though we are God. We're not God. We are not God. And so people need to really temper their expectations when it comes to men. But you know something? We also have got to, as men, as gay men, we got to also stop adopting these characteristics of our oppressors, of the men who hurt us. Because I've noticed that also after a gay man gets out of a relationship with a narcissist or a narcissistic individual, what ends up happening is that they start adopting that mindset and they start taking those behaviors and those thought patterns into new relationships, right? And that's what's wreaking havoc. They're still taking the stain of their former relationship into their new relationship and wondering why it never lasts. It never lasts because you're taking in some really toxic elements into the relationships. You're taking in some really bad dynamics. You knew that that wasn't right when you were in the relationship with your ex. You knew how he was acting towards you was not right, but yet still you reenact that behavior in your new relationships and then you wonder why they don't work out. Because you're taking on the personality, the traits, the energy, of your oppressors and you're showing up in these relationships with that energy and then you're wondering why new partners are just like forget you a lot of gay men have, have have been infected with the energy of their exes a lot of them they have been infected with the energy of their exes and they drag that emotional baggage into the relationship and then wonder why the dudes don't want to carry it please I'm just saying this, the cure for all this is do your work. Go to God, love on him. Forget this life, this life ain't it. This life ain't it.
Focus on God. Focus on getting yourself right. Focus on getting yourself spiritually stronger. That's what's important. Because at this point, you ain't not, you're not getting... You're not getting no act right from these dudes know how. And you ain't gonna. I'm here to tell you, you ain't gonna. So you might as well just chalk it up and do what you need to do for self. You know, praise God, it'll last longer. Because when I think about my relationship with my Heavenly Father, that's lasted me longer than any relationship that I've ever been in. So you know something, I'm gonna focus on the relationships that last and leave the ones that didn't in the past. So, once again, y'all, thank you for listening. I love y'all. Please comment and share if you have any ideas or suggestions or even your own experience because I would love to hear your experience. All right? Peace, y'all.